here is class 15, Flexible Mechanical mechanical Elements 2. We're going to deal with uh, wire ropes almost exclusively uh, today. So there's a number of things that we want to learn about wire rope uh, to start with. Uh, first off, um, it's uh, made up of small wires that are wrapped together uh, to form a strand and then the strands are wrapped together quite often around some kind of core. So they're given uh, these uh, designations. Uh, you'll see 6 by 7, uh, 6 by 19, 8 by 19, 6 by 37. And what those are is the first is the number of strands and the second is the number of wires. And quite often the ones with a smaller number of wires are bigger diameter wires. And they have a lot of advantages. Um, to strength, but they're not as flexible, right? If you have small wires uh, that are made up of the, the, the things that are making up the strands, they're much more flexible, and uh, so they can resist fatigue, bending fatigue, right? So, because we, most of the time, uh, we have to bend uh, uh, these over uh, like a drum or a sheave. Now, um, if they're thick enough like here, you might call them for haulage, right? So what they mean is that they're, no, they're never really going to go over a drum. Um, but if you're going to use it for a hoist or something, uh, then it has to go coil up around a drum and go over pulleys, and they're going to be flexed back and forth over and over again. Um, another aspect is that you really do need lubrication inside uh, in these, right? They need to be lubricated. Um, some of the uh, the core can uh, like absorb some of the uh, lubrication and kind of store it. Some of the core can be uh, actually hemp um, gets used on the inside. Um, but uh, if there if that's not possible for whatever the application is being, they actually use uh, um, another wire inside. Uh, or it could even like be sort of a cable itself that's going to be inside. Um, so there's like a lot of twisting uh, that goes on in the process of making uh, these cables. So a lot, a lot of times the, the wires will actually be pre-twisted and, and, and they'll actually start out with that twisted form. So, where, so they're not being like put into extra stresses or, or being pre-stressed. Uh, um, to uh, so so like they, they don't have like residual stresses uh, from from the twisting process. The most common lay, and they use that word in a couple different ways. Sometimes lay. Um, the most common lay is this regular lay, surprise, and uh, where the coils are twisted in the same direction. No, excuse me, the opposite direction. Excuse me, the opposite direction from the strands. Right. So. Uh, the, the, the wires within the strands are twisted in a certain direction and then when they put the strands together they put them into the opposite direction. So that's the regular lay right there. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the wires appear to be going straight down, right? The, down the length of the thing. That's sort of, it's actually a deception. Uh, they're not going straight, but they appear to be straight. The other version is the uh, Lang lay. Um, and uh, what that is is they're, they're, the wires are, are coiled around and then the strands are coiled and they're coiled in the same direction right there. Um, I'm trying to remember one of the two ways, uh, one of the advantages, I'm trying to remember what the advantages of the Lang Lay um, are in, uh, I think there's some amount of resistance to rotating of the no I think it's actually the other ones uh, uh, the, the, the anti-rotation one you can imagine though because of the twist of the thing if they're hanging something it might start to you know just free free hanging it might start to move twist because of the uh, the wrap of the, the coils so I kind of thought that Lang was the one that prevented it but Lang is not nearly as common um, one of the things that's uh, not great about Lang is uh, that as it rubs over things, um, it can cause abrasion, obviously, to the thing that it's ru running over, but also to the individual wires. And that brings up like one of the ways that things fail, or, or the ways that thing, uh, wires fail, uh, that we have to consider when trying to, to choose, right? So here's the, a chart, this X chart, 
um, that, that gets used in, in a lot of places. Um, it's in the wire rope technical board uh, created this thing. I'm trying to remember what the name of it is called. Um, it's like the wire handbook and uh, you can acquire that uh, from various places. Um, I tried to find a uh, online free copy of it and I, I didn't uh, I didn't succeed in it but uh, um, we, we, I, I will look through a little bit of the wire catalogs that uh, I've, I was able to uh, find online and you can see that this thing shows up and so you'll see that these uh, d different types I'm trying to think what the FW stands for the WS um, oh there it is down at the button filler wire oh filler filler wire uh, okay these are actually the patterns uh, that you might see. So the, the, you'll see there's the Warrington, the seal, and their f and the filler wire right here. Some of the available multi-wear strand combinations are also applicable, right? So there's like the different patterns, by the way, of uh, the way these strands are connected. And sometimes they have larger and a combination of larger and small wires. Um, and they do try to like nestle them in between the gaps, right? To try to to, to fit all these, uh, to fit them in, to, to minimize the amount of gaps. Another thing I'd also mention is that uh, uh, some of these wires can actually like rub against each other um, at, at ever so slightly. So there's a, a certain amount of um, that kind of contact failure. But you'll see that um, uh, it, over, over to the left right here in terms of number of strands um, you, you, that we have, uh, we, we're going from six down to 18. Um, you'll see that they these have the uh, list res least resistance to bending. So if you go down and have greater, you have uh, the greatest number, like so you see there's 46 wires uh, right in there. And uh, so that, that's, that's a lot of wires uh, right there. But that's gonna have the least resistance to abrasion, right? So that's gonna be like the rubbing uh, of the uh, of the wires and how they fail. So when we're talking about types of failures, I think it's going to be good to go to and check out uh, this handbook. Um, so let me let me pause and make sure I find the right page. Okay, so here's something by uh, Union, um, a wire company, right here, and um, we just want to take out the big ship, right? The big container ship. Ooh. I like big ships, I tell you what, but you know, they don't just use ropes right there, they actually use uh, uh, wire ropes, right? They don't use hemp ropes uh, for um, this large, and but you could imagine all the different cranes uh, that are taking place and all the cables inside them. You can see some of the pictures up there. Um, I liked some of the pictures out of this. You could see, like, okay, so you see the red uh, uh, coil right there. You can see that they're they're not you know there's there's a bunch of parallel uh, um, strands if you will as part of this and I I liked uh, some of the single layer right here here's the seal and you can kind of see they use the small wires to kind of fill in uh, the gaps right in here and especially like this filler wire uh, right here I kind of like to look at this combination pattern it's kind of trippy. Um, and uh, so you can see here some of the classifications. They went up all the way to 61, apparently, like wires per strand uh, and these classifications. Um, and I guess there's, there's names. So like, there's also brand names, by the way. I think these are, are like trademark names. You can see that they're registered trademarks uh, to the different ones. Um, we might be interested in stainless steel wire for ours. We're, uh, we might be thinking about like aircraft uh, uh, cable type of wires. Where ours are probably going to be kind of small compared to some of these, but we'll, we'll check it out right here. Um, oh, there's, there's some good pictures of the regular lay and the land lay. The Lang lay right there, right? And, and there's right and left handed lay, so uh, something to be aware of. Uh, you know, something twist to the right. Um, you say that if you look down the end, it looks like the thing is that they're, they're, they're coiling over to your right, right, or, for, or looking over to your left uh, for the the left for the lay of the um, of the wire. Some of the uh, uh, ways that things fail, like so, right here is a, um, a couple of good things here. You can see that this right here is basically a typical thing that happens when you have fatigue, 
right, has ended. But here we have, you can see this, that uh, the, the wire can be crushed, right? And that could be um, because of being on the drum, or it could be because it was going over a sheave or going over, you know, going over just like a rail or something. But also, the wires can be crushing each other when if you're going to have multi-layer wraps on a drum. So uh, th those are failures uh, that to look out for. Um, it's interesting here that you can see the cross section of a worn wire where it's been rubbed onto something here. But you could have something where it's a cross section of a peened wire, and that's almost something's been hitting on top of it instead of. So it's in, you have rubbing, but we also have like a, kind of like a more of a, a crushing type of failure uh, that you could see in individual cross sections. Um, Something that I didn't uh, bring up uh, um, or put in the notes there, but the connections that we make uh, between the wires are, are kind of important. So I want to try to remember uh, to look at some of those. Uh, check this guy out right here. I think it was called a python in another uh, in another book, but it's kind of interesting. I don't know how, quite how uh, they're able to make uh, that shape uh, uh, onto the thing, but I thought it was kind of cool. And um, we have other uh, things about failure. Uh, I'm trying to look uh, through here and find them. The end treatments, that's kind of an interesting uh, thing to look at. Um, they do need to be lubricated. Here you go, here, here's uh, some more failure stuff that I was looking for. Uh, so you can see fatigue failure. Quite often, the, 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 there's actually an allowable number of these little wires that, that can break before you decide uh, that the thing has had its life. Um, uh, here we go. That is this fatigue breaks. Ooh, that's kind of ugly. Um, you can see bird cage is caused with a sudden release of tension, from resulting rebound. That's kind of cool. I think that's cool. Um, it jumped. Uh, that has jumped a sheave. Or right? the rope curled as it uh, went went to the edge of the sheave. Um, pretty cool. Drum crushing is caused by small drums. So we want the, the, the diameter of the drum is kind of important right there. Um, it's also, we'll see that that's where bending stress uh, it occurs in drums. Um, you can see we could get kinks in cables and that type of thing. So um, there's a, th these are types of failures. Let's take a look at the different kinds of stresses uh, that are in dr uh, wires right here. And I think after that, we might go to our main example. Um, there's quite, quite a bit to uh, cover in the, um, in the stresses uh, area right here. So let's, uh, let's check him out. All right, so um, the first kind of stress is just as much as you'd expect, right? It would be like if you were to take a cross section of a wire of a cable right there, right? And we see that we have these little wires inside them. Well, you could say that this thing has an area that's just of the metal, right? And we're going to have a cable tension onto this right here. And so that right there is if we have like just these uh, cable tension uh, or applied right here, we would have a just tensile stress. Um, and this is AM, and this is the approximate metal area. And we find that uh, from, for us at least, it's going to be a table. Um, 20, uh, uh, 1727. So I have the book out in front of me, so I will uh, jump on to those and just show you where each of these things are uh, as we're going in here. So um, it's kind of weird because it's kind of in two places, um, actually. Well, some of these are in two places right here. But here you go, 1727. And you can have the area of the metal. And we have um, only three choices in this book. Some of the other books cover, have about two more. Um, so they didn't have a wide uh, array. But uh, you can see 
um, that we have 0.4 times d squared. Now that d, that's the um, nominal diameter of the, of the rope. All right, so that's the total rope, right? Sometimes you'll see DW, that's the wire, individual wire diameter. You'll see capital D, that's gonna be the sheave diameter. But the little d is going to be uh, the rope diameter, right? Um, so it's some value times that diameter squared is what we find for AM. Um, now, th this is not in Shigley for some reason. Right, so Shigley's treatment of this basic thing right here is uh, uh, they have a qu this equation that says Fu over Ft, right? So uh, where Ft, Fu is the ultimate, uh, um, the ultimate uh, uh, load uh, limit, maybe the old, uh, I'm trying to remember uh, the exact name. Let me let me look in uh, Shigley and make sure I quote the thing the right way. Wire load Fu right there, right? So we can have a safety factor where we're saying, okay, here's just simply this is what we're saying the uh, the wire uh, can withstand. Now. Um, they don't write it out this way, and I don't know why, but uh, other books do. And um, what we could find, and it, this, this is weird right here, okay? So one thing, they give a strength right here in KSI, but in the examples, they don't use it right here. So I don't know why. Um, they're saying in the footnote here, the strength is based on the nominal area of the rope. Figures given are approximate and based on a one inch rope and sizes and uh, one quarter inch aircraft cable sizes. Okay, um, so, but if you go to the, uh, a little bit further on here, is where they give the ultimate strength right here, okay? And so what the what we want to do is use the ultimate strength of whatever um, uh, uh, steel they've decided to use of these three, and they seem to always pick the smaller of the of the range uh, right in here. It says unfortunately often the designer and vendor. So these are like the actual individual wire. Uh, strengths so it's uh, so, something to uh, to pick up on they seem to uh, say that we're going to take fu and that's going to be equal to the ultimate strength times the metal area right there right so this the all the individual wires uh, the inner area um, or the approximate times the ultimate strength is what's going to be this ultimate load limit and then FT, um, you know, we could just as e we, we could uh, say that it's uh, also related right here. So um, we, we might want to also uh, say that we want to have a safety factor. So we could say, so this is like the same as saying uh, um, that the safety factor that we would find is the ultimate times AM divided uh, by the um, this times am right just noteworthy and that this safety factor right here is in part available from uh, table uh, 1725 so let's take a look at 1725 and right in uh, that's not true 1725, I just went past it. Where'd you go, 1725? There it is, right there. So 1725, there's the safety factors, all right? And so there's lots of different things that safety factors are based on. Remember our discussions uh, in ME370. When we're picking out safety factors, they're, they're really covering uncertainties, right? And that's the, uh, and um, some of the uncertain, but also they're covering to, to make sure that we protect human life or protect things. So you can see that safety factors, minimum safety factors for wire ropes are pretty, uh, are pretty large. Um, by the way, these do not pr preclude fatigue failure right here. So these are all like static failure uh, safety factors. 
um, we're going to be doing some hoisting. So five is about ours. But you can see that um, all different types of these. Now, some of the reason why they're there is also for like dynamic loads. Uh, things can be stopped quickly, and all of a sudden they go boing, and that, that's going to be a much larger load uh, that gets placed at it, that uh, shock load. Um, okay, so uh, another type of, uh, of uh, stress that we would find is going to be um, bending, right? So we know that bending is MC over I, right? And I will try, I'll make bend. Uh, right in there. That's that's our basic equation uh, for the thing. But we mostly will see bending that's based on a sheave or, or or a drum, right? When and let's just say that it's got uh, some amount of uh, uh, this di di. Oh well, it's got this diameter. Let's say it's got a diameter right here. Uh, the sheave or drum diameter. Well, if you recall of the flexural equation, uh, that the, the fundamental thing that was uh, uh, establishing uh, how we did beam deflection, um, it looked like this. M, whoops, I always want to write uh, something on the top when it doesn't belong. M over EI is equal to 1 divided by the curvature of the beam, right? So we took little elements and we said we get we like usually like a little segment right there and we figured out and we, we were able to like just from a free body diagram of just one little chunk right there establish this relationship. Um, but for us right here, the curvature of this beam, if you were going to treat this uh, rope like a beam. The curvature is really going to be the radius of the drum right here, right? So for us, it's actually going to be one, um, two over the drum. Well, if we manipulate this right here just a little bit and substitute uh, uh, in for this right here, right? Um, what we will see, like let's let's take I. Let's get let's rearrange and find out I so we can substitute here. We could also say, by the way, that C is going to be equal to the wire diameter divided by two, right? So it's these are the individual wires, the stress in the individual wire because they were bent, right there. That's where uh, we decide that the uh, the C uh, the, this is going to be. I have to double check on, on that right there. It kind of bothers me that that. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, so let's let's uh, solve for uh, this I right in there, and what we find we get M D divided by two E. So replacing it in into here, we get the bending stress is going to be equal to M D W over two divided by M D over 2E. You can see a lot of things cancel out. And we get this sort of the interesting slash surprising relationship. I'll write it down here. That bending is going to be equal to DW divided by capital D E. And let's put an R right in there, okay? Because it isn't just the um, elastic, uh, uh, the, the elastic coefficient of the uh, of the individual wire. It's of the rope itself, right? Because there's many strands. It's much more flexible, so it isn't as as rigid, um, right here. And this is equation C, if you will, in the uh, in the book. For whatever reason, they didn't give it a uh, an actual number. They gave it a uh, uh, thingy right here. So that's that equation uh, right there. Um, and once again, this is the modulus velocity of the rope and not the wire uh, right in there. Um, it's much more flexible uh, because there's lots of small little wires uh, taking place. Um, but we could also say that we could have an equivalent force 
right here. We could have because they like to do things in terms of force. So we have the ultimate force. We have the tensile force. And we could also have the FB is the equivalent bending force. Um, so they they write this out right here as E R times D W A M divided by capital D right there. And so that's equation seventeen forty one. right here. Now we use this in conjunction with bending fatigue, right? So there's bending stress, but we also do this in bending fatigue and we use this with a diagram that um, is a figure uh, 1721 and you'll see this in a lot of books right here where we have cycles and it's not an SN diagram exactly, but it is similar to it in concept, right? Um, and what it uses on here, instead of stress, it actually has this ratio of P, which is like the pressure that's being felt between the drum. So this is actually sort of a contact thing. It's actually related to the contact pressure as well, right? Divided by um, SU, right? So it's a ratio of those two things. And it's um, times a thousand in our book right here. So let's let's take a look at that um, relationship right here. And you can see that it is P divided by SU. And here's number of bends to failure right there. And then there's the different types of ropes uh, that you can see. And um, so we want to relate back to what that pressure is uh, going to be. But we take, um, and we f for evaluating this, we take a, um, a friction force, right? So we go to F, F. I know it's weird. We're, we're using these forces right here. It kind of, it's, kind of, it's kind of trippy. Um, so this is like equation uh, 6, uh, excuse me, 17, of uh, 44. So we have equation 1744, and um, I was looking for my, the fatigue tensile strength, right? So they're calling this strength um, part of the thing, but uh, uh, so let me see. Yeah. Fatigue tensile strength is going to be that PSU times SU, right? Because we're looking this up from uh, that figure and multiplying by SU, which is the tensile strength of the wires, uh, times the sheave diameter, and times the rope nominal rope size, right? And all divided by two. And I don't ask me why that two is right there, because I was uh, puzzling over that. So we have this P over SU uh, times our SU, and make sure that we uh, check our units as we're coming through there because there's a thousand right here um, that might be KSI right here so those thousand that KSI uh, might be might might work out with each other um, just double check with the range that you're in of the thing but we'll say that this right here is um, equation uh, 1744 Right, so this is it, it. Whereas this is like bending that's causing um, uh, these things. Uh, this is the uh, the strength of things. So we will we will take a look at those, and then lastly here we have the contact pressure that's taking place between the drum and uh, and the wire right here. So I tried to draw this thing out like this right here, kind of actually maybe make it a little bit better. So we have uh, a rope coming down there, right? And we have a force um, that's plying on there. But you can see that we, the, here's where the uh, pressure uh, is going on there. And, and um, they kind of assume often that the, your, your drum is the kind of drum that will have like grooves all, already in it so that the wire, uh, or excuse me, the, the, the rope 
um, actually sits inside uh, you know the, these a uh, little thing so it kind of cradles it a little bit as opposed to being uh, just a uh, a rope on a flat sheave but uh, um, I'm kind of used to seeing this occur more than uh, this but uh, some of these numbers are actually for this I believe um, but we'll see that that pressure is going to be two times whatever the force of this thing is going to be uh, divided by D and divided by big D right so there's the rope diameter and here's the big diameter uh, right here so what, what we've really kind of done is we've taken more of a projected area um, across this right here and we have like this maybe we could call it a nominal pressure uh, if you will and that's um, right here by the way this is equation uh, 1742 okay and so the tensile force in the rope and we call this we call this the bearing pressure right here so this is also known as bearing pressure so let's do the example that I have to try to um, uh, and it's very close to what your uh, what, what will be homework and your project uh, it's a, a, a application that's similar to what we're doing so hopefully this will help 31 minute lecture 